Just to give you a quick overview of how I think about reaming the S for the uh, S tabular component. Um, first is I level the pelvis, uh, and then you know I do um, some things with my uh, first reamer that might be a little bit different than the middle reamers and then uh, final reamer. And so in general, I'm aiming to use two or three uh, uh, reamers, uh, three millimeters under, one millimeter under, so I get a one millimeter press fit. And I'll give you some examples. So just uh, real briefly about the OR setup. Um, so we have the uh, instrument uh, back table on the surgical side. We have the fluoro come in across the non-operative side, and then I have the fluoro base on the opposite side down by the legs. And I like to look down at the um, screens on the fluoro base as opposed to the screens uh, up on the boom at my hospital. Uh, the fluoro base uh, uh, screens are a little bit more high definition. So um, this is the position that I'm standing in uh, when I'm reading for the cup. Um, I've got um, capsular tags, so number two uh, stitches, one on the anterior capsule flap, one on the posterior flap. Uh, I work my reamers in around those and standing here. I've got uh, an offset reamer. I have the reamer handle rotated 90 degrees to the side, and it's left to right specific. Uh, and so the a brief point I wanted to make about um, the ergonomics for reaming, you can adjust the table height, uh, raise or lower it based on your height and what's comfortable for you. So when you have those cases where you have that really dense sclerotic bone and you really have to lean your body into the reamer, um, uh, being able to adjust that uh, table height in a fine-tuned way really helps to facilitate that. And then similarly, if you um, want to slightly increase the anniversion of your reamer, um, you can just lower the table one or two clicks. It allows you to um, get your reamer in that ideal position. Um, you can imagine if your table is a little bit too high, your elbows are up pretty high, and you lose some of that mechanical advantage. So um, briefly, just about leveling the pelvis. Uh, so I rotate the uh, table. I use the HANA table. Uh, I rotate the table uh, in order to level it. And then occasionally, I'll have to adjust the inlet or outlet to the angle of the boom. Um, and then adjust the table height. So um, on this image here, um, on the patient's left, you can see that ischial line uh, bisects the teardrop, whereas on the right side, that ischial line is lateral to the teardrop. And then I look at the pubic symphysis, and it is um, to the patient's right um, in relation to the middle of the sacrum. So I'll airplane the table, and now we have symmetric relationship between the ilio line and the teardrop, and then that pubic symphysis is uh, midline with the sacrum. And then I'll say in, um, in instances, if there's any previous you know, pelvic ring trauma or asymmetry, generally speaking, um, I look more for that relationship between the ilio line and the teardrop more so than the symphysis to sacrum relationship. And here's another example just for repetition. Again, on this side, that ischial line on the patient's left hip uh, bisecting the teardrop, and it's a bit lateral on the right screen. And you can see that pubic symphysis is um, rotated towards the patient left. So airplane the table to the right, um, and everything lines up uh, symmetrically. Um, so then, um, just notes on my first reamer. Um, I like to hold my reamer in the desired position for my final cup position. So I'm generally aiming for about 15 to 20 degrees of anaversion and about 40 degrees of abduction. I put the AP pelvis on the right screen on the fluoro, and then I um, bring the fluoro into an AP of the hip um, on mag. And what I find is that when I move from the AP pelvis to an AP hip, the abduction angle appears to increase slightly not more than five uh, degrees, but I like having um, the feedback of um, the AP pelvis and the AP hip uh, prior to reaming. And my goal uh, with my first reamer is to medialize to my target depth while taking into um, consideration at the same time, am I going to, um, where is my hip center of rotation going to end up? Um, and so, um, you know, if there's Anything to take away from um, this talk would be this slide. So the, I'm using the 
um, shape of the ellipse on my reamer to help judge the antiversion. And then for my abduction angle, I look at two, um, two data points um, simultaneously. I'm looking at the relationship between the apex of my reamer, um, its relationship to the ipsilateral SI joint, and then I'm looking at the um, line from the teardrop, the bottom of the teardrop, to the superlateral rim of the native acetabulum on the jumps abduction. So again, here I've got my first reamer. I haven't reamed yet, and I'm just holding that reamer in the relative position with where I want the final cup to be oriented. And so I'm uh, tracing a line between the bottom of that teardrop and the superior lateral acetabulum, and then I'm looking at where the rim of my cup um, will um, cross that line. Is it going to be parallel or is it going to be uh, slightly tangent? And then I look at the apex of this cup. Where is it pointing in relation to the ipsilateral SI joint? And here it's aiming slightly below. So now when I move from my AP pelvis to the AP hip, again, I haven't changed my hand position at all. When I get my AP of the hip, I'm not necessarily trying to get the cup in the center of the fluoro screen. I'm trying to see just a little bit of that um, pubic symphysis, a little bit of that SI joint, and then I've got those landmarks in mind when I start reaming. So if I just start in this position and ream straight in, I'm going to raise the hip center a little bit higher than what I like. So you see that slight change there? I'm just abducting this first reamer a little bit so that I can medialize without raising the hip center. And so that's um, where I started and then where I end up after the first reamer. And then uh, my second reamer, and this could be the final one, um, I'm reaming more to engage the peripheral um, bone in the acetabulum in the rim, um, more so than medializing. I've already done uh, the medializing with that first reamer. And I'll show you some examples of where we can get some feedback about the um, press fit that you'll achieve with your final cup. Um, you know, everyone, everyone's different. I'd say in my practice, maybe 5% of the time I'm using uh, acetabular screws. So. Um, First reamer, second reamer, um, you see there's that little halo between the border of the reamer and um, where I'd previously reamed with the first reamer. So I'm uh, engaging the rim and I'm medializing a couple millimeters, two or three. Um, and then for my final reamer, I say to myself, uh, hit the rim on your way in. So in other words, I'm um, engaging the rim, and then once I get to the point um, medially where I've gone with my previous reamers, I just uh, let the reamer kind of spin in place. I'm not pushing too hard. I'm not medializing. And here I'm just correcting any imperfections I had from the previous reamers. And then um, that final point there, um, I'll show you in a, in a uh, separate slide. So this uh, image on the left of the screen is the final reamer. Um, before I've kind of reamed it in. And there's maybe four or five millimeters between the reamer itself and where it will finally medialize. That gives me an idea of when I've inserted the cup past the capsule around the um, femoral neck, and it's just sitting on the rim. Um, in my uh, experience with this, uh, you know, with this workflow, um, it gives me a, an idea of the kind of press fit that I'll get with my cup. Um, later on, so that's a it's a sign to me that um, you know I don't need to ream up to the next size. You know. So there's on the rim, and then uh, finally seated. So here's some video, and uh, here this is just me leveling the uh, pelvis. Um, it it wasn't apparent to me uh, at first, but um, after I'd done a couple of cases, you know, sometimes you come in, you get your first shot, and the AP pelvis just looks um, really asymmetric, and you're um, trying to figure out how do I get this oriented to what it should look like. Um, just rotating the um, screen so that the um, transition line is parallel to the bottom of the screen, it really helps correct some of that imperfection. So you rotate the screen, and then you airplane the table, and 90% of the time you can get um, the pelvis to be level to your satisfaction with you know, less than a minute of effort.
So here's a video of my first reamer. Uh, different case. Um, this is probably a um, case where I'm um, probably going to use just two reamers. Um, and the abduction angle is slightly higher than uh, what my intended final uh, uh, position would be. And then a little subtle point to point out that AP pelvis on the right um, compared to the um, AP of the hip on the left, you can see that that AP on the left it looks more abducted, but I haven't changed my hand position. I just moved the fluoro uh, machine, so that's uh, something to keep in mind in this technique. Uh, then with my uh, middle reamer, um, again, this is more to engage the um, rim and periphery than to fertile the further medialize. And then uh, here's an example of my final reamer. Um, and then this is um, more of a style point, but um, when you have softer bone and you've got concern about, um, you know, am I going to blow through the medial wall if I ream too aggressively, I kind of squeeze and release that trigger um, as I'm applying pressure. And then I'll, I'll check a fluoro shot after maybe a second or two of just squeeze and release. And that helps to uh, prevent uh, over-reaming or over-medializing uh, through soft or osteoporotic bone. Um, just some quick examples. So I use this technique for both primary uh, hip replacements as well as uh, cup revisions. Um, here's a good case for an anterior approach. A uh, really huge, long uh, spinal fusion. Um, aseptically loose cup, well-fixed stem, um, and so I just get that old stem tucked out of the way up in the um, lateral uh, rim of the acetabulum. Again, I use the same um, principles as I do for primaries as for the revisions, and then that's what the final cup looks like. Um, it's also a really good um, technique for prior acetabular hardware, and then the, um, the, the counterpoint I'd make to uh, direct um, to uh, direct visualizing while reaming is that so you can sometimes get fooled or um, you know, get surprised or mistaken based on whether you have a lot of previous scar tissue overgrown bone, such as a case like this, or if you have really large hypertrophic osteophytes, you know, oftentimes end up surprised with um, where your reamer or where your cup ends up based uh, uh, compared to what your external landmarks appear. So I'd say this technique helps to reduce uh, or eliminate those surprises that you can see on post-op x-rays sometimes. And then um, finally with a, a cutout nail, which is also a pretty common uh, case that we do um, as arthroplasty surgeons, um, where if the screw cuts out and it starts to um, erode a little bit of the um, superior rim of your acetabulum, um, that's another instance where you could lose that uh, direct visual landmark um, and you could get some in uh, useful feedback with uh, fluoroscopy. Um, and uh, here's just one more example of a uh, hip that did well for about 22 to 23 years after posterior approach, then it started dislocating from polywear. Um, and then I think the um, point that this revision case can make is so that that margin there between the medial aspect of the old cup and then that um, medial wall of the acetabulum. So you can ream down pretty precisely to the medial wall um, without passing through using this technique. And so I'd say one other advantage could be a primary hip replacement you're doing in someone who's relatively young. You're wanting to preserve some of that medial bone for a possible later revision in life. Uh, using this technique can help you uh, very precisely uh, place your center of rotation. Um, another similar example would be a case where there's a lot of high natural offset and you want to leave some of that medial bone in order to um, uh, not have to make that offset up with your stem or your ball length. Um, and this helps to facilitate that. Um, and then just a final word of caution, um, just being aware of a pelvic tilt. This is a case of an anterior hip replacement that developed early uh, posterior subluxations. And so this was the uh, intraoperative fluoro shot. And this was the, um, the post-op x-ray in the office a few weeks later. And so I was asking myself, how did I get from a, a cup antiversion that looked like this to one that was, you know, at best flat, if not retroverted? And then I looked at the, um, 
op trader for Raymond's and saw that when this person is standing, their um, uh, pelvic tilt is increased. So when we went for the uh, revision in this case, I used my, um, my standard techniques for leveling the pelvis, and then I just um, brought the floral machine into about 20 degrees of um, I'll have like an inlet view in order to match the position that her pelvis was in when standing. And so I'd say this was the um, fluoro shot with the 20 degrees of uh, inlet view. And this was the um, normal position. So you can see there's a lot more antervision here than if you don't uh, correct for it. So uh, final thoughts, take home message is the reaming under fluoro does allow for a precise control of the cup position and hip center rotation. Uh, can help to eliminate those surprises that you sometimes see on post-op or intra-op x-ray. And the workflow uh, remains consistent from primary through uh, complex cases.